Now hear the word of the Lord from Mark 8, 27 to 38. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. And as they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say you are one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the lead, leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling, uh, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, sojourn. Peace be with you. It's good to see you guys. Good to be with you this morning. Um, if you're a guest with us or visiting, welcome. My name is Jonah. I'm one of the pastors here at Sojourn. Our mission as a church is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the good news of who he is and what he has done for us. Build one another up as his church and send each other to follow him as instruments of truth, beauty, and goodness. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, I was supposed to announce to you all that we have an angel tree out there and we're getting presents for kids at Fairmont Elementary, but the nine o'clock took all the presents. So sorry guys, I, we don't have enough uh, angel tree opportunities for you here at the 11. If you do have an angel tree gift though, if you picked one up last week, please remember to bring it back this week. Um, bring it back this week. And also this week, we have caroling coming up, as you heard. Um, and listen, who here is super excited about singing with strangers, two strangers, in the cold of a Wednesday night, right? It's a little bit into a couple of, a couple, wow, the culture is building. Um, <laughs> most of us look at this experience as bizarre and uncomfortable. Um, maybe we like the idea of it, but we don't necessarily want to participate in it. Um, we're not really a, uh, like a door-to-door -door evangelism church, but for one night a year. Uh, and so just this is a night where we get to gather together and we get to announce good news. We are good news people. And we get to go to people's houses and announce good news to them about light breaking into the darkness. And I'm telling you, people are overwhelmed by the kindness of it. Uh, people cry. People send church letters of gratitude. And so if you have like a half a percent of interest, just reach out and grab that rope of faith and come with us, people. I'm telling you, it'll be a beautiful, wonderful night. And then we get to come back here with our kids and our families and eat popcorn, watch Charlie Brown, drink hot cocoa. It's, it's really one of the best nights of the year. Um, it's one of the things my kids look forward to most. And we are not like, we're not the Von Trapps in our family. You know, that, that's, is that an outdated reference? We get that reference here? Uh, okay, thank good, thank God, um, thank good. <laughs> Uh, I've been talking a lot today. So I would really encourage you guys um, to come and give it a try this Wednesday. It's a beautiful night, um, every night of the, every year when we do it. So I hope you can come. And then uh, last, I hope this isn't a downer, um, but I didn't know how else to say it to you guys. Some of you may remember that we applied for a grant for our playground and we did not receive the grant. The city of Charlestown got our grant, people. Um, which is fine, good for them, right? Good for them. Uh, I'm not upset about it, only a little bit, um, a lot of bit, but they got it. And he, part of the problem is, is in writing this grant proposal, I really convinced myself what a big need this is for us. Um, 
And so uh, Chrissy Smith, she's one of our deacons, she's our director of Sojourn Kids, worked with some of our families with children who have special needs in our church, and uh, to do some research on the opportunity that it brings. And I'll just give you a couple of stats that blew my mind. Um, roughly 50% of parents whose children have special needs said they don't participate in religious activities, whether that's a Sunday gathering or church events, either because the church facility can't accommodate them or the church people don't accommodate them. So the combination of having a welcoming facility and a welcoming people uh, is keeping these people and their families from coming to church. And some estimates have that between a 90 and 95% of individuals with various disabilities have been unreached by the gospel. And most of that is from just practical facility issues or a culture of openness and hospitality towards people who are different than us. Um, the very first renovation we did as a church was to make these main bathrooms handicap accessible. This was a, a gym that was built in the 1960s. And, and so we've been trying over the years to make our, our facility more and more inclusive for people with various forms of disabilities. And so um, the playground grant was for $150,000. If you've never looked at commercial playground equipment, it is breathtakingly expensive. And uh, we don't really, we're not really a church that has 150 grand just sitting there burning a hole in our pockets. Um, but we wanna start uh, kind of like an inclusive building fund, an inclusive meaning for folks with various physical needs, uh, where we wanna start chipping away at things like we need ramps to get in. I forgot the word stairs at the nine o'clock service, if you wanna know where, what my mental condition is right now. We wanna build ramps so that people in wheelchairs can have access to our children's wing. Um, things like that uh, make our, all of our bathrooms handicap accessible, and hopefully one day make a, build an inclusive playground here on, uh, on our property. And that alone is going to be like $150,000. Uh, we're going to keep pursuing grants. Um, and we're also just, this is going to be what we're trying to chip away at with our year-end giving this year. Uh, if you're out here and you're like, man, I've been wondering what to do with this $150,000. Maybe this is the Lord telling you what you are to do with it. Uh, but in all likelihood, in our church, we're just kind of the little engine that could. So if you participate in year-end giving, if you're looking for something to do here as we come to the close of the year, uh, we're opening up this fund where um, as funds are there and as opportunity arises, we're going to keep making our building more handicap accessible and uh, approachable for people with various disabilities. So if you'd like to give to that, if you give online, there'll be a drop-down menu that says year-end giving, uh, or if you write a check, you can put that in the memo line. Um, if you'd like to talk more or see our plan, so you know where your $150,000 check is going. You just feel comfortable to talk to me. We got designs and professionals and all that kind of stuff working it out. So uh, I'm excited to see what happens with that. So, all right. That's all I had to say about that. Y'all ready for a sermon? Say yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Maybe you guys are ready. Um, so you guys remember the movie The Sixth Sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes things a little bit easier. If you don't, uh, spoiler alert, the movie's 25 years old, and you should have seen it by now. If you haven't seen it, maybe this will make you want to see it, but uh, the, the movie was released in 1999, okay? So there's a big twist in it that I'm about to spoil for you. If you're like really, maybe just walk out if you're like, don't spoil the 1999 movie for me. Um, the movie, Bruce Willis plays Malcolm Crowe, who's a child psychologist, trying to help uh, Haley Joel Osment who plays a character named Cole Sear, uh, helped this kid through his struggles because uh, the kid, Cole, claims that he talks to ghosts. He sees ghosts, which means obviously he's crazy, and Malcolm is there to try to help him work through this seeing of the ghosts things. Um, there are bizarre clues placed throughout the whole movie right from the get-go. The very first scene of this movie is Malcolm Crow being shot in the head. Um, what typically happens to people who get shot in the head? They die, they die typically. Um, but we, I saw a comedian describe it this way recently. He's talking about this movie. He said, we thought it was more believable that his wife just didn't talk to him for three years <laughs> than maybe Malcolm Crowe actually died. Um, this guy who's a PhD psychologist with his own practice doesn't know how to open doors after being shot in the head. His wife doesn't talk to him. And the big reveal is... <gasps> Malcolm Crowe has been dead the whole movie. He's a ghost. Haley Joel Osment is talking. And it's like, it blows, it blew our mind. Um, that was the big twist at the end. He's been a ghost the whole movie. No one saw it coming. Um, I was in the, I saw it in the theater and I gasped when I, it was like, oh, 
I just couldn't believe it. It felt like the most dramatic plot twist of ever, I had ever seen. And everyone I know that saw The Sixth Sense in a movie theater, after you saw it, in a couple of days, you went back and saw it again. And were like, how did I miss it? It had been there the whole time. They, right from the beginning, they told you this dude was dead and dropped clues the whole time. And so when, once you saw the twist, it changed everything about the movie. You had to re go back and reconsider everything that came before it. Um, every interaction, every detail, every subtlety. Um, we were shown the story from the very beginning, but we didn't really see it until nearly the end. As we get here in Mark chapter eight, and specifically the second half of Mark chapter eight in Mark's gospel, we are getting a similar plot twist. The kind of plot twist where everything from this moment forward changes and it will force us to go back and re-examine everything that we've heard, seen, learned, every interaction from Jesus up until now. Uh, we were told how the story would end from the very beginning, but that was shrouded in mystery. Words like Messiah, words like Christ that we didn't really understand what, meant, what they meant even though we were told from the very beginning. The first, two or the first eight chapters of Mark take up about two years worth of time. And from here on out, we slow down to a couple of weeks. The pace changes. The focus of the stories change. It's a dramatic shift from this point on. And it all begins with a brief interaction with Peter placed at the center of Mark's narrative. It's the unexpected moment. It's the plot twist that will force us to re-examine everything that we've seen about Jesus this far. So let's, let's dive in. In verse 27, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Uh, the geography here is really, really important both for what we're going to talk about today, but more so what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, Caesarea Philippi was once northern Canaan. We talked about Canaan a couple of weeks ago in Mark chapter 8. Uh, this was a place plagued by paganism, uh, competing religious ideas. And everybody who lived in or around there got the creeps from this place. Uh, everybody thought that this place was bad news. Caesarea Philippi sits at the foot of Mount Hermon. It's the tallest mountain in the area on the foothills of Bashan. You can go read Psalm 22 and consider why did Jesus quote about the bulls of Bashan on the cross, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. Um, but Mount Hermon, Bashan, Caesarea Philippi, these are all names that would have made people's blood run cold in the region. Uh, for the Jews, why would it make the Jews scared? Uh, in Judges chapter 3, we're told that the god Baal lives on top of Mount Hermon. Um, at least that's what they believe. They, in fact, they called the mountain uh, Baal Hermon. Uh, so they believed that this evil, rebellious, spiritual being lived on top of Mount Hermon. Um, after the conquest of the promised land, Canaan, um, a, a Jewish king was upset that people had to go all the way to Jerusalem to sacrifice and worship God. So he said, why don't we just build two golden calves and put them here at Mount Hermon and we can worship the gods who took us out of Egypt. Uh, so for the Jews, Mount Hermon was the place of demonic incursion, evil spiritual forces coming into the world, rebellious idolatry, demon worshiping. It was a place of false gods and false worship, sin, demons, evil. So when Jews heard Bashan or the bulls of Bashan, when they heard Mount Hermon, when they heard Caesarea Philippi, alarm bells ringing in their heads. Uh, the Romans, the Romans called this place the rock of the gods uh, because they believed that it was where gods came down to earth. Uh, specifically, they believed that it was the home of Pan. There was a, a Roman temple built to Pan there at the base of Mount Hermon. Uh, Pan was the Roman god of fertility, and you could probably guess how they chose to worship the god of fertility at the base of this mountain. Whatever you're thinking, it's worse than what you're thinking. Um, bad news happened there. Bad stuff happened there. And so when Romans heard about it, they're like, oh man, that's where that kind of, that nasty pan worship stuff happens. Uh, the Mesopotamians, the Canaanites who lived there, they called this place the gates of hell uh, because they believed it's where uh, rebel spiritual evil forces invaded the earth. Does any of this sounding familiar? Uh, this idea that spiritual forces came and invaded the earth. Well, where did they do that? At Mount Hermon, at the gates of hell. That's what the Mesopotamians called it. They believed that there was a literal underground passage to the underworld at the foothills of Mount Hermon. So the point is Jews, Romans, Mesopotamians, 
Whoever was around there, everybody believed that this place was bad news. It was a place of evil, of spiritual oppression, and, and, and darkness. And it's so important that this story in Mark comes to us after the disciples don't understand the mission of Jesus. They don't understand his miracles. And what did we see last week? Jesus opens the eyes of a man who's blind. And now we find ourselves in a place of spiritual darkness and blindness. In a place of spiritual darkness and blindness, a place of competing gods, of pagan worship, of idolatry, Jesus asks his friends, who do these people say that I am? And if you were listening to what Asia said, you will hear that there's no real consensus. Some people say this, some people say that, some people say this. It's inconclusive. Um, there's no consensus on who Jesus is in this land of competing gods. And so again, two plus years into following him, two plus years of listening to his teaching and his miracles and seeing all these wonders that Jesus has done, he puts the question to them directly, not who do the crowds say that I am, but in verse 29, he looks to the disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Isn't it, I mean, isn't it a little bit relieving and encouraging that Jesus waited over two years to ask his disciples? He, he let them go to church for two and a half years before doing an altar call. You know what I'm saying? He talked to them for years and years before he's like, all right, guys, what's, where do you really stand with all of this? And so for, for some of you, I just want you to know that you just don't really ever see Jesus in a hurry. Um, he's patient with you, just like he's patient with them. And may we be a people who are patient with those around us as God has been patient with us. Um, let's be patient, but also realize that at some point, the question is going to come to you just like it came to the disciples. So who do you really say that Jesus is? And as we might expect, Peter steps forward and replies, you are the Messiah. You're the Messiah, the chosen one, son of God. Uh, these are the opening words of Mark's whole gospel. In Mark chapter one, verse one, he says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. That's Mark chapter one, verse one. And then after that, we get this beautiful story of Jesus' baptism and things take off. Uh, here though, Mark says, so seven chapters of kind of ambiguity about who is Jesus. Mark, or Peter puts it plainly. And then listen, Jesus began to tell them, verse 31, that the son of man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed. This is the point in the movie where you find out Malcolm's been a ghost the whole time. Uh, this sounds so familiar to us. Of course Jesus would be killed. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. We, we say this. This is the plot twist that we just can't wrap our minds around the scandal of this moment. We, can't, we don't have the imagination to believe that this is the kind of Messiah that would come. We can't understand how different of an idea this would have been for them. Jesus did what they did not expect in many ways, like healing the sick or touching lepers or welcoming in Gentiles. But more than all of that, no one anticipated that Jesus came to suffer. Humans never came up with the idea of this kind of Messiah. They thought a conquering king would come with an army to make Jerusalem great again. He would build this huge platform and he would take over and rule with an iron fist and crush all of their oppressors. No one, no one was looking for God to rescue his people through suffering. All of the other gods of this area all of the competing gods of this area, like all of the competing gods in our own lives, demanded sacrifice. Do this for me, and maybe I'll let you live. Do this for me, and maybe I'll let you live. But here, at the literal gates of hell, the literal rock of the gods, Jesus says what kind of God he is. He is a God that loves you, and he will suffer for you. Have you been the least bit uncomfortable about all the times up to this point that Jesus has told people, don't, don't tell anyone what I just did for you? Have you noticed how often this has come up? He heals somebody and he's like, don't say anything to anybody. Um, why is he doing that? Why does Mark make such a point of doing that? Uh, because if, if all we see is Jesus as the miracle worker, that will shape our imaginations to see him in a certain way. Um, if all we see is Jesus as a teacher, that will shape our imaginations in a certain way and we will miss who Jesus is. Mark will not let us answer the question, 
Who is Jesus apart from the suffering of Jesus? The passion, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus are the decoder ring for all of Jesus' teaching and ministry. We cannot interpret who is Jesus and what is his kingdom without his suffering. And Peter, he just can't wrap his mind around it. The confusion of Peter is not because he's just this like rebellious idiot. It's because this was so breathtakingly unexpected. It, the plot twist of Sixth Sense does not hold a candle to the plot twist of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was just so beyond any kind of imagining that people had. And so Peter is freaking out. And he says in verse 32, he took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. He's not disagreeing with him as much as he's disagreeing with Jesus. Not with just what he said, but with what Jesus is, is doing. The word means to express a strong disapproval of someone. Not just the content of what Jesus is saying, but Jesus himself. He's saying, you can't suffer or die. This is not what you're supposed to be doing here, man. Yeah, the Messiah is supposed to do this stuff, not this stuff. You, you can't do this. You're wrong, Jesus. This is not how the story is supposed to go. Anybody ever said that to God before? This is not how my story is supposed to go. And that's what Peter is saying to Jesus. And this is, this is amazing. This is one of these details that makes me love the Bible. The last time Jesus was affirmed as God's son was at his baptism, when dad shows up to the big day and he says, this is my son and I love him. Where did Jesus go right after his baptism? Anybody remember? <laughs> he went to the desert to be tempted by who? Satan. Satan. So he gets this beautiful affirmation that I am, a, I am God's son and he loves me. And then he gets led out into the desert where Satan says, hey man, you know how this is going to go for you. I mean, I've got an easier way. If you would just do this, everybody will worship you. Just bow down before me. Just do this. He tempts him for an easier way, saying, wouldn't this be easier? And now Peter comes to him and says, there's no way you can do this, Jesus. There's, there's a different way to do this. Here's one of my favorite details of the Gospel of Mark. Verse 33, Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. So Peter reprimands him, and then Jesus, it's like he's taken back. He looks at his buddies and is like, you believe what this guy just said to me? Don't you check this guy out. And then he says to Peter, get away from me, Satan. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. The same thing that happened after Jesus was affirmed as God's son at his baptism is happening here. The voice of Satan is coming and saying, there's an easier way for you. Who wants to suffer, Jesus? This is not your story. It's not how it's supposed to go. Jesus is saying this rebuke to Peter, but he's also saying it to the shocked audience in the movie theater. He's saying it to the people who cannot fathom God rescuing us this way. We, we do not have the imagination to see victory coming through suffering. We do not have the imagination to see victory coming through death. But God can and God does. Jesus is saying to Peter, there is no other way. Stop acting like Satan. Stop this. There is no other way. If we want to join the Advent journey, we talked about this last week, from darkness to light, from blindness to sight. If we want to answer the fundamental questions of Mark, who is Jesus and what is his mission? We must see that the journey from darkness to light, from blindness to sight, is a journey on the road of suffering. If you want to see the Christ this Advent season, you must see his pain. If we want to behold God incarnate, a baby in a manger, we must see that this baby was born to bleed. Just like we all went back to rewatch The Sixth Sense, we have to go back and reinterpret everything Jesus has said and done through this promise to his disciples. I must suffer. I must die. And this could not be more practical. This is not just like an intellectual literary exercise. And there's just two examples that, that come to mind for me. Uh, first way this is really practical is we finally get an answer of how does God feel about me? 
of, if you're visiting with us or your guest, this may, may not apply to you, but for the folks that have called this place home for a while, um, more than anything else, I feel like we are a people that are wrestling with the question, what does God really think about me? Consider the images we have, or even the metaphors we have of who Jesus is up to this point. Maybe Jesus is a teacher telling me information I need to know. Well, what does he think of me then? He thinks that I'm ignorant and that I'm needing correction, so he teaches me. Maybe Jesus is a healer. He sees me as sick, and I need some medicine. I need some antibiotics, so he heals me. Uh, maybe he sees me as hungry, and so he's a feeder. He sees that I need food, so he comes and he feeds me. How does this kind of God feel about you? What is his disposition towards you? Well, you're falling short and you need help and he has resources to aid you, which is true. And it's good that he has resources to aid us, but that leaves us feeling anxious and guilty and like God is at arm's length over time. It leaves God feeling like the United Nations and he's coming to drop off humanitarian aid and then he'll go back home to his country where everything is fine. He gave me some help, so I better make good on his promises. These are the images we have in the Gospel of Mark so far. Jesus is a teacher. He's a healer. He's a feeder. But if Jesus' suffering and death is to be the central way we answer that question about God, how does he really feel about me? We have a much deeper, a much stronger, a much more profound answer. If Jesus' sufferings are the center, who does he see me as? First, he sees you as his child destined to die. He sees you as a child who is terminally ill. How might your imagination shift if you saw that God's fundamental posture towards you was that you are his child who is sick, not his sinner who is guilty? What did God warn Adam and Eve about in the garden? He said, if you eat from this tree, you'll be a sinner and you'll be in trouble. Is that what he said to his children? He said, if you eat this tree, you'll die. And die we have over and over and over again in so many various ways. Are you a sinner who's guilty? Yes. But is that the heart of what God sees you as? No. He sees you as his child who is terminally ill. What would you do for your child who is terminally ill? If you're a parent, I think you would say anything. 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 He sees you as his child who is terminally ill. So moved with love for his child, he takes death upon himself. Seeing his children destined to die, God becomes a child destined to die. Jesus absorbs death. He takes it upon himself to reunite us with our father to bring us back home earlier in Mark, we alluded to this by saying, Jesus issues full pardon and warm welcome. He sets you free from sin so that you can come home to the source of life, the family of God. God loves you like a child, so he takes your suffering upon himself. The darkness of Advent can make us wonder if God is with us, if he loves us. Life can make us wonder if God is with us and if God loves us. But the sufferings of Christ answer that question definitively. God is for you because God loves you and he shows you this. He demonstrates this to you by suffering for you, by absorbing death for you. No other God sacrifices for you. Have you thought about this? Nothing else that demands your attention, demands your sacrifice, returns the favor. Pick your religion, pick your worldview. No other God sacrifices for you. No other God suffers for you. It's just the opposite everywhere else but here. In Jesus, we see that God is for you and he loves you and he shows you this by suffering for you, absorbing death for you. So the sufferings of Christ answer the question for you, how does God really feel about me? He loves you like a child. Second, this reality helps us make sense of our own sufferings. Some sense, I should say. Jesus continues, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. 
But if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news, you will save it. What does it mean to give up your own way? Probably means a lot of things. Um, I think one of the things it means is stop pretending like you know how your story is supposed to go. Any more than you know how the sixth sense is supposed to go. Any more than you know how the Gospel of Mark was supposed to go. Um, I, I don't know what losses you are facing. Um, I don't know what pain you are enduring. Um, I don't know what unexpected realities you are carrying right now. I don't know how your life has left you disappointed and unfulfilled. But what I do know is that the author of your story is trustworthy. How do I know he's trustworthy? Because he suffered for you. If the author of our story is trustworthy, we can let go of life on our terms and instead follow Jesus. What do you mean? Let go of your life. What do you mean? Maybe you need to go figure that out. Have you tried living your way long enough to know that living your way is maybe not going so good for you? Have you tried trying to author your own story long enough to be a little bit skeptical about whether or not you even know what's good for you? Maybe it's time to try something new. What should I do? Just, maybe just try to turn and follow Jesus. What do you mean follow Jesus? Trust him and go learn what that means. Trust that he's for you and loves you. When you forget, which will probably be in five to 10 minutes from now, remember that he suffered for you to reunite you with God. And so, so listen, this might sound a little bit crazy. Can I go off my notes for like two minutes? Yep, doesn't really matter if you said no. I mean, you can leave, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, Mike. Uh, I've been working for churches for 20 years, which is weird to think about. Um, and I've spent a lot of that time telling people what they should do. Um, and I've learned how to make people feel bad for the bad things they do. And I'll tell you, making people feel guilty about what they do, they can really change for a little while when they feel bad. Um, or giving the sense of like holy duty and obligation. This is the mission of God. Um, you can get people to do stuff that way for a little while. Uh, any of you know what it's like to feel guilty all the time for like 15 years though? How does that shape the way you feel about Jesus feeling about you? <laughs> well, I was told for 12 years, 15 years, 20 years that he's disappointed and mad at me all the time. And then we just get so tired. Just get so tired even thinking about reading the Bible. And, uh, you know, recently what I've learned, you know what makes Christians make really wonderful decisions? Faithful, bold, courageous, beautiful decisions, free and empowered decisions when Christians believe that they are so desperately loved by God already, that there's nothing left to fulfill, there's no one left to prove or impress, you are beloved now. And when Christians really believe they're loved and free, they do really beautiful, incredible stuff, free from all the pretending and the pressure and the damage that that guilt and anxiety produces. So maybe we could just trust that God is for us and he loves us. And when we forget and we're tempted to feel guilty again, we remember that we have evidence of God's love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus suffered for you to bring you home, all the way home. God is for you and he loves you and he demonstrates this by suffering for you. So follow Jesus. Amen. If you're willing and able, please stand with me and we'll pray.